this is Julie Johnson, and this is the second part of the presentation on statistical process control and understanding variation. In this presentation, I'm going to focus on the mechanics of constructing run charts and control charts. I think it'll be really helpful if you also pay special attention to the readings for this section, as they will help you delve in more deeply into some of the mechanics and how you might apply them in your own setting. The run chart is an analytic tool commonly used in quality improvement, yet it's been underutilized in healthcare. I think one of the most powerful messages from this presentation is how helpful the run chart can be for you in looking at your own data. The run chart's more valuable improvement work than aggregate summary statistics. Looking at your data over time makes process performance visible. You're able to determine if changes resulted in improvement. You can tell whether you're holding the gains. It also allows a temporal analytic view of the data versus a static or enumerative view. They're very easy to construct, and they're easy to understand and interpret. And finally, they provide a foundation for more sophisticated methods, such as control charts, which we will also be discussing in this presentation. Now, we talked about this earlier, but I'm going to show you again. This is the anatomy of a run chart. On the x-axis, you have a variable, which is the variable that you're studying. On the y-axis, you have time. This can be days, weeks, months, quarters but it could also be sequential patients or visits or procedures. And we plot a median line, which will be the center line. And people often ask me, why do we plot the median and not the mean? We want to make sure that the center line is not affected by extreme values. So half the points are above and half the points are below. Here's an example of a run chart that demonstrates compliance with a standard procedure. On the x-axis, we have percent compliance. And on the y-axis, we have the weeks that are numbered sequentially. And what happened is that every week, the improvement team plotted a data point showing the percent compliance. And as we start looking at our data over time, we see seven points that are plotted, and then they formed an improvement team. They started testing and adapting changes in week 10. They implemented changes, and we start to see a change, and their percent compliance starts to increase. And then finally, we see that they're approaching their goal. Now, what's also interesting in this display is that you're able to annotate. You're able to write in where you formed your improvement team, where you started testing different changes. You can also put in a line that will show the goal that you're trying to achieve. Here's another example, and this also illustrates how the run chart preserves the time order of the data, which allows you to visualize what happened over time, compared to a bar chart, which is shown on the left-hand side of the slide. So I'll give you a second to look at this, and you start to see that we're looking at three units, unit one, unit two, unit three, and we're looking at how they actually reduce cycle time, and we were comparing the units, and you can see that they have very different data displays. Now, if we were to use a bar chart, as we show on the left, and we show the results for the three units combined, and we look at the cycle time prior to the change and the cycle time after the change, we have very little insight into what the changes might have resulted in, how the data actually changed based on our improvement. There are some rules for how you identify non-random signals in run charts, or those special cause variation. The first rule is about shift. Six or more consecutive points, either all above or either all below the medium. The values that fall on the medium do not add or break a shift. And we skip values that fall on the median and we continue counting. So we're looking for shifts in the data. And this will indicate non-random signal or special cause. The second rule is about trend. We're looking for five or more consecutive points all going up or all going down. And if the values of two or more consecutive points are the same, we just count the first and ignore the repeating values. This chart displays the rule about trend. The third rule is about the number of runs. Runs are a series of points in a row on one side of the median line. Too few or too many runs or crossings of the median line indicate non-random signals. And the fourth point is about an astronomical data point, something that is obviously different from the rest of the points. One of the limitations of using a run chart is that you're not able to determine if a process is stable. And for that, we must use the control chart. So again, here's the anatomy of a control chart. It's similar to a run chart in that we have the units of measure on the x-axis, and we have the time or the case number on the y-axis. We have a center line. This time we use the mean, not the median. And this time we apply an upper control limit and a lower control limit. And these limits are calculated from the data. In a run chart, there are four tests for detecting special causes. The first test is a single point falls outside the control limit, either the upper control limit or the lower control limit. In the second test, two out of three successive values are either on the same side of the center line or more than two standard deviations from the center line. Now, not everyone uses this test, and depending on the resource that you use, one of your readings or one of your books, you may decide not to use this test. 
The next test is eight or more successive values fall on the same side of the center line. And the fourth test is a trend of six or more values in a row steadily increasing or decreasing. Now I want you to think about these different methods for detecting special causes in a run chart and control charts. A special cause in a run chart is indicated when the presence of too much or too little variation the presence of a shift in the process, and the presence of a trend. In control charts, a special cause is indicated when a single point falls outside the control limit. Two out of three successive values are on the same side of the center line and more than two standard deviations from the center line. Eight or more successive values fall on the same side of the center line. And finally, a trend of six or more values in a row steadily increasing or decreasing. Either one of those will indicate a special cause. One of the most common statistical process control charts is an XMR chart. So now I want to talk about the mechanics of how to create an XMR chart. There are two components. There's the X chart, which are the observed values of the data that you're looking at, and there's the moving range chart, which is calculated from the observed values. So the first thing you need to do is to calculate the average of all your data points. You list the data in its time series order, and you calculate the average, or the X bar. You plot the individual observations, and then you use the average to mark the center line. This is quite similar to what you did when you created a run chart, except you're using the mean, the X bar, instead of the median. The next thing in creating your XMR chart is to calculate the moving range and its average. So you calculate the difference between successive observations, that's known as the moving range. You use absolute values, so you ignore any negative numbers or minus signs, and there should be N minus one entries for the moving range. And then you calculate the average of the moving range. And finally, you multiply the average of the moving range by a correction constant known as E. The reason that we use the moving range and we calculate its average is because we use that in constructing our control limits. So our control limits are X bar plus or minus E times the mean moving range. And E is a correction factor that depends on the subgroup size. It's very important, I think, for you to go and, and read this Muhammad paper that helps you understand and delve more deeply into plotting basic control charts. Muhammad recommends that we use 2.66 as E, or the correction factor. Now, standard deviation is calculated quite differently in SBC than what you learned in basic statistics, and this is why we use this calculation, E, to calculate the upper control limit and the lower control limit. But you may often hear people talk about three standard deviations as the limits. That's not actually correct, so I want you to be very careful about how you think about calculating the control limits for your XMR charts. Now, here's an example of systolic blood pressure for a patient over 26 days. I took this example from the Muhammad reading. So the readings are listed sequentially, one through 26. The blood pressure is listed sequentially for each of those readings, starting with 169, ending with 174. So you calculate the moving range by looking at the differences between each of those readings. So 172 minus 169 is three. That's the first value that's listed there for the moving range. 175 minus 172 is also three. That's the next value. And remember you use absolute numbers, so you're looking at the positive numbers here. The mean of those numbers is 173.2. The mean moving range is 11. And then using our correction factor of 2.66, we calculate the control limits. So 173.2, which is the mean, plus or minus 2.66 times 11. So 173.2 plus 2.66 times 11 is the upper control limit of 202.5. 173.2 minus 2.66 times 11 is the lower control limit of 143.9. And finally, we plot the numbers and this is what it looks like. So the essentials of the XMR control charts is a display of data over time. The center line is the mean, the moving range is the point-to-point -point variation in the data. The control limits are generated from the average moving range. And then information about special and common cause variation is interpreted using those specific rules that we reviewed earlier. The moving range calculation is always needed to generate an XMR chart, but the moving range graph is frequently omitted in the display of the chart. Now I'd like to finish this part of the presentation by talking with you about 12 tips for measuring improvement. I found this from the Health Foundation in 2014, where they outlined 12 tips for measurement. 
And I think we've covered many of these in our webinars, and we'll talk more about them when we're together in September. But I would like to highlight two points here, which I think are really important when we're thinking about data and our ability to work with data and to understand it. One is that it's important to engage a statistician and information analyst early. And the second point, number 10, is use statistical process control charts to understand progress on a regular basis. So one thing that this blog is highlighting is that we need to be comfortable enlisting people who can help us with data and data displays. And we also need to be sure that we're looking at our data over time. Thank you. Thank you.